Hello, this is Gordon McRae. Welcome to the Humanity Podcast, the regular audio update from Humanist Society Scotland. This episode was recorded at the Just Festival's first Science, Faith and Society event in March of this year. The panel was chaired by Dr Mike Fuller from the University of Edinburgh and featured Gordon McRae, Chief Executive of Humanist Society Scotland, Dr Douglas Veneman from the Royston Institute and the University of Edinburgh, and Dr Marlo MacDonald from the Church of Scotland. We hope you enjoy it. Thanks, thanks very much for being here, Thank you. It's a, it's a great pleasure on your behalf to be able to welcome our three panellists here this evening, with whom we'll be exploring issues in human genetics and epigenetics, <coughs> and some of the ethical conundrum which these may or may not raise for us. Douglas Veneman uh, is a researcher at the Rosslyn Institute, where he works on epigenetic regulation, about which I, as I'm sure all of you, look forward to hearing a great deal more in just a few moments' time when uh, Doug will give a presentation to us. Uh, Doug moved here four years ago. He was previously a researcher at the University of Oxford, having originally studied in Belgium. He assures me that he is not French. <laughs> Gordon McRae is the Chief Executive of the Humanist Society of Scotland. He spent many years working in the voluntary sector, previously working for WITCH and for the charity Shelter in Scotland. And Mary MacDonald is the uh, uh, Chief of the Society, Religion and Technology Project of the Church of Scotland, which he's been running since 2008, a molecular biologist by training having studied at the University of Glasgow and St Andrews, and having spent 20 years on lab work, uh, much of it looking at leprosy. Right, without further ado, Douglas, can I invite you to uh, open these Thanks, boxes? Mike. Thank you. So thank you very much um, for organising. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. It's actually the second time I'm giving a talk uh, here. So, um, yes, I, I'm a scientist, and my role here, I'm not trying to... Um, convince you about whatsoever, uh, I just want to give you an overview of what genetics means, what epigenetic means, and, uh, and then um, show you a bit the progress of the technology and uh, where, where we're going with the science, and of course the, the, uh, the ethical issues that can uh, be raised uh, from, uh, from this. So the other thing I want to say, um, um, uh, I'm not a religious person, but uh, I'm very biblical, so I will make some, uh, a bit some uh, inspiring correction uh, here. So, of course, uh, the first thing I would like to introduce you is the, uh, the genome, so the genes. What means the genes? So the genes obviously means the DNA. So the DNA is these long little uh, molecules that you, you can find from them, uh, forming those little structures we find in the nucleus of the cells called the chromosomes. So in, uh, the humans have uh, 20 pairs of chromosomes, 20 pairs because there are 20 coming from the mother and 20 coming from the father. And this is a very long molecule, it has this double helix structure, and it would decondense this structure, it would be even higher than this long little string of about two meters high. It's very, very long, but it's very, very compact, right? And this double helix structure was discovered by Watson and Crick in Cambridge, and they got the Nobel Prize in 53. And about um, 50 years later, um, we discovered the, the nature of these long molecules and to find uh, the, the, the secret, if you like, uh, will come in this uh, important molecule of life. So how does it look like? I mean, this is how DNA looks like. You can see those letters. There's about four letters, A, B, B, C. So we have about three billions of those letters to form the whole DNA, which we call the genome, okay? So three billions, but each of us have millions of differences. This is why we are all different and all unique. So four different letters. Now, of course, the, the key important uh, observation, I, I'm sure you all thought about this already, but every single <coughs> cell in the body have exactly the same DNA sequence, but of course, brain cells, blood cells, muscle cells are completely different, okay? So there was a, a very important embryologist in Edinburgh called uh, Conrad Wellington, who came with this idea called the epigenetic landscape. And because he was based in Edinburgh, I, I suppose he was um, inspired by the Monroe, but the idea is that if you go on the top of the Monroe, you take a bow, which is actually um, a first, the first cell generating an individual, so the first cell of the embryo. If you roll it down the hill, 
this border can go either way of a uh, different uh, corner of the valley, okay? So that's basically the, the development of a unique cell stream and lots of different cells you find in the body. So that means that there's something else that in the genes that makes a cell becoming a brain cell, a blood cell, or a muscle cell, okay? So that's what epigenetic means. It means something beyond the genes. So this is obviously the environment. So the environment <coughs> is what you eat, what you drink, what you breathe, the stress, of course. Uh, it could be also, you know, infectious like, uh, um, you know, viruses and, and bacteria and so on and so on. So I will give you here first two key examples to show how important is the environment, <coughs> is your genome. And I will give you a third example uh, a, third, uh, a further later. The first example is honey bees. Honey bees are fascinating. So in the hive, you have two types of bees. They're all female. You have the workers and you have the queen. The queen stays in the hive all the time and lay about two to 3,000 eggs every day. Whereas the workers <coughs> have a different sort of duties uh, depending uh, during the lifetime. So they get promoted and you start from a, a cleaner and you end up with a private guard of the queen. So it's quite fascinating. But what's happening is uh, all the eggs are produced by the queen are distributed in those little cells and they will produce a bee. But some of the cells are very specialized, the two ones you have in there, and the, the larvae are fed by a special liquid called the, uh, the royal jelly. And the royal jelly is the only component that will determine if an egg will produce a queen. Okay? So you may think that maybe the queen knows in advance that those special eggs are genetically better or whatever and I will make a queen. It's actually not true because if you make an experiment, you take some random eggs from those little cells, you replace them by the other one and you feed them with the royal jelly, they will become a queen, okay? So that's one thing. The second thing is the difference between the queen and the workers, although it's the same, just by the royal jelly, they will live 10 times longer and um, they, uh, they're much bigger as well, okay? So you can call the, the, the royal jelly the fountain of youth, literally, and as you can imagine, uh, a lot of producers have been trying to produce it, uh, and it can be actually a very expensive, that's why nobody can afford it, or almost maybe only the riots can actually afford it, which maybe makes sense. Mm -hmm. So that's the first example, just to show you that just one component, okay, uh, the nutrition is extremely important. Now, another key example are identical twins. Our identical twins can be called clones, if you like, because they have exactly the same DNA material, okay? These two ladies are ad identical twins, but they've been uh, adopted at birth by two different families, and only 40 years later, they found each other. And I'm sure you will be quite surprised because they don't really look identical twins. You can still argue there may be some cosmetic component there, you know, uh, one has some makeup and some uh, haircut or whatever, but the science behind this is that um, people have been using a cohort of uh, over 40,000 uh, uh, pair twins, and they show clearly that twins develop different diseases during their life. So that clearly says that actually it's not all about the genes, it's that um, you know, two identical twins can develop completely different diseases. Okay? So the future is not written uh, within the genes. And the, the, the other example, which is kind of twins, but um, uh, in a different way, because here they are, uh, of course, born at the same time, but uh, we can talk about uh, cloning. As you know, Edam was very famous for that because Dolly the sheep was cloned about 20 years ago. Besides that, they were celebrating in September a, a, a big um, symposium celebrating the 20th of Dolly the sheep. So now we can, clone, we can clone a lot of different animals, um, excluding humans, and we can discuss this uh, during the debate. I don't have to explain what this slide is all about, but you know, if you have enough money to uh, try to clone your cat, you're gonna pay 50,000 pounds, and I'm sure you're gonna be very disappointed because the clone has nothing to do with the original copy, okay? So you're gonna waste your money and you're gonna be very, very disappointed. Now, let's, let's go back to epigenetics and try to understand what are the molecular basis of this. The things to know is that the DNA itself and some other component uh, can influence how the, the genome, so all the, all the genetic machinery will behave. So as mentioned, the, 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 the genome, all the, the DNA is this long string, but actually it's highly compact in chromosome. It's very condensed. 
The condensation is made by those packaging proteins, like a bubble wrap, that will protect the genes. And if the genes are very protected, they're not exposed, so they will be more likely to be shut off. Okay? If they decondense, they will be expressed. So the degree of compaction of those genes will make that the genes can be expressed or not. That's one thing. The second thing is those ATGC can be modified in a certain way, and I'm going to explain this in a minute. And all of this can actually tell the message to the genome, says, what, what to do with it, okay? So it's not about those letters, but all these letters are interpreted. It's like reading a book, right? okay? So now, what's the real definition? So first of all, what do define epigenetics as heritable changes, so it's heritable, in a cellular phenotype that are independent of activation of the DNA sequence. So I try to find some very uh, key examples to explain you what it is all about. If I write genetic, in English, and then I make a mistake and we try replacing the C by a K. That's not English, obviously, but you can Google it. It's actually valid in Turkish. And it means genetics as well. So it sounds the same, okay, and it means exactly the same, although there's a mistake. This mistake is actually a code of polymorphic, which is all the million difference I, I've been mentioning to you before. So we have millions of polymorphic between each. But that's perfectly normal. There's a variability between individuals. Now, if I do the same kind of exercise, I change the C by a Q. It's actually not valid in any language, so you can call this a mutation. Now, a mutation doesn't always mean a mistake, so a mutation can be perfectly neutral, okay, with no impact. Some others can have an impact when involved in certain diseases. Now, Epigenetics doesn't mean any change of those letters. So I need to find another word for that, unfortunately. So um, that's where maybe my French is taking part. <coughs> if, I, if I use preference in English and I write it in French, you will see that the letters used are exactly identical as in English, but I put these two accents on the key. Okay? So for this, we called we using a writer. As is precisely what's happening in the cells of your body, you have these little proteins called writers that will transfer the, the, the English version to the French. And even better, when you're writing a letter using words and you select, oh, I'm selecting French language, if you write the first E with an accent and you're missing the second one, what's happening, the computer will correct for you, okay? So you have a reader and a writer to correct the language. Then you can reverse the process from French to English, we use an eraser. Okay? <coughs> so epigenetics is perfectly reversible, whereas genetics, those mutations, when it's happened, you can't explain them. That's a big difference. Okay? So now epigenetics sounds like a big revolution, but it's not, because the first person who discovered that was back in 1964. Okay? It's just that today we understand more of epigenetic works and it becomes more fashionable. So, just to summarize, we have three types of proteins called enzymes, and these can generate an edit, removing the edit or recognizing the edit. Okay? So, these are called enzymes, so they have a, a, a physiological activity, and because they have this activity, you can actually block this activity using inhibitors. So that's how an enzyme works. An enzyme has a substrate, and what uh, the uh, pharmacology industry uh, is doing is to create an inhibitor, and these inhibitors will compete with the natural substrate. The key example is the aspirin. If you have a headache or you have inflammation, aspirin is what the aspirin is doing. Okay? It's competing and blocking an uh, somatic activity. So today, a lot of companies are uh, developing those drugs, and these are very successful because I can already tell you that a, a few of these are already used uh, for treating patients in clinics. So what we're doing here in the lab is that we are working on the first phase to try to understand what this writer and eraser are doing. Once we know what they're doing, we try to block the activity using different drugs, and we can collaborate with different companies producing these, validate if you can manipulate the expression of these genes, okay, without changing the sequence, so there's no genetic manipulation here. Think the aspirin, which is exactly what it does. And then validate this in different uh, models, including animal models, and then if it's approved, uh, we can then uh, use this in human disease uh, for, treatment, for treatment. So I've been showing you what 
genetics means what epigenetic means. Now, what are genetic disease and epigenetic disease? So genetic disease, as I say, is an alteration of the DNA sequence, but it can be also uh, a matter of um, the number of copies. They're not a matter of genetic material. So there's three types of genetic disease. The first is for monogenic, only one gene is involved. And a key example is cystic fibrosis or a different form of anemia. And I will show you an example in a minute. The other one doesn't involve any change in the DNA sequence, but the, the amount of material. So if you have an extra copy of a chromosome, for example, chromosome 21 in the Down syndrome, is a, 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 a chromosome abnormality, but there's no DNA change, there's no mutation. Or it could be called multifactorial, it means that you have a lot of mutation, and that's quite common in cancers. Now, what is an, a pure epigenetic uh, disease? It's something I define as something odd, okay, something unexpected, that genetic doesn't explain. So I discuss identical twins, including the clones. I discuss the bees. And I'm gonna show you another um, um, uh, example. Uh, it's a case of um, anemia called thalassemia. It's quite similar to sickle cell disease, which is more uh, commonly uh, known. So this is, again, a disease very common in, uh, uh, in South Africa or Southeast Asia, where um, patients are anemic, so the, 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 the delivery of oxygen in the body it doesn't happen uh, properly. And as you know, the delivery of the oxygen is made by the red blood cells. So these are red blood cells, they look in blue because we're using a, a special dye to color them. But you can see a few of them have those little dots. And the dots make the cells really sick that they can't catch the oxygen, okay? But you will be surprised that some of the cells doesn't have those dots, okay? So these patients are born with a specific mutation, which means that every single cell in the body has the same mutation. But only a few of the cells behave like sick cells, and the others look perfectly healthy. So this, this is something that genetics cannot explain, right? But with epigenetics, we can reverse the process. So people trying to understand this process and says we can reverse the situation using simply drugs where the cells with the little dots can become like normal cells, okay? So now moving to understanding disease and where the, pro the, 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 the technology is progressing, obviously a, a, a very uh, a basic uh, approach people are using is epidemiology. That's very simple. You know that malaria happening in some area in the, in the world because we have mosquito, uh, you know, having the uh, falciparum uh, parasite infecting actually red blood cells. This is another, another, another disease involving uh, red blood cells. So epidemiology is a science that studies the pattern, the cause, and effect of health and disease condition in the defined population according to Wikipedia. So that's looking worldwide. But now you can look, instead of worldwide, you can look genome-wide to say, looking at all the DNA sequence that is now available, okay, you can sequence people that easily, and looking in this, in this sequence, is there's nothing that you think that you can link to a disease. So how does that work? People taking a group of individuals having the same disease, and they're looking at their genes, and they found, oh, actually, in this kind of group of breast cancers, there's the same kind of mutation happening. So then people can associate a, a particular mutation as a signature of breast cancer, okay? This is called genome-wide associated studies. The problem with this, and you will see where the ethics uh, is coming now, we have a lot of healthy individuals that surprisingly have those changes as well. But these people are perfectly healthy. Think about the red blood cells, it's a bit the same idea. So either these people are exceptional or they, uh, they will never develop the disease or actually they might develop the disease in the future. And we still don't know. But the problem is now with the, the, the power of the technology, of course, some companies start to claim, says, well, actually, we can read now your DNA, we can read your future. So it's a bit having a crystal ball, and they can tell you that, ah, we're reading all these kind of sequence from you, and uh, actually we found that somewhere you have, you can see this little A I try to highlight in red. This little A there is not good news. When I say not good news, it says the chance of developing something in this little A is very poor, but it's higher than other people. I mean, what does that mean? So, Different companies develop this business, and a key one, and you probably heard about them, is called 23 and Me. 23 because I mentioned the 23 chromosomes. For $99, just fitting a little tube, you send it to the company, a sequence, 
all your secrets and they send you back a letter with the good and the bad news. The good news is say, oh, you're highly protected. Uh, you, can, you can drink whiskey for the rest of your life. You will never get any liver condition. But uh, you have to be careful for your heart because uh, you, know, you have high risk, blah, 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 blah. The problem with this is that people, all the types of scientists, decide to say, OK, let's, 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 let's have a try. They've been submitting the same samples to different companies, and the interpretation of the companies was completely different. <laughs> So, you know, your $19 dollars but becoming, you know, a, a, bit, a bit higher. So they closed down, they were removed from the market in the U.S. by the FDA, the Food and Drugs Administration. But a few years later, they came back with more robust type of uh, screening. And um, you can see that this actually is, so this was a screenshot um, uh, a few years ago. Um, and now uh, I did this last week. So you can see now they, in the U.K., 425 uh, pounds. So uh, it has increased, but obviously it's more, uh, it's more accurate. But again, what does that really mean? It being at risk of something. As I discussed with Mike, you know that you know from your grandmother that if you drink two bottles of whiskey per day, uh, you know it's not going to do any good for you. If you are having a specific A or not, don't do it. But doing good sport, try to have a jogging every day. I think uh, you know it won't kill you. So and. To move to the debate today, obviously, you can start to think, you know, the complication uh, and the implication of this um, is, uh, you know, if everybody would decide to screen themselves, you know, newborn babies, uh, the impact, the social impact it can have, think about, uh, I put Facebook because that's a very important um, uh, network, how people are going to interact together, how people are going to find their partner, say, you know, someone you want to have children with, you know, make sure they have the right genes for you and see how they're compatible with and so on. And something funny enough, um, talk in Belgium, we have, um, I took it with me here, we have a uh, quite sophisticated ID card. It's like a bank card with a chip, okay? So the, your, your, your uh, health uh, insurance is doing similar types of cards. We're not there yet, but they have all the details, maybe a bit some medical history, but maybe in a maybe in a decade, um, uh, all your, your DNA sequence will be in here. So each time you go to your GP, they know exactly what's happening to you, blah, blah, blah. If they want to give you a specific drug that makes sure it's perfectly compatible to you, they will be able to know it by reading this card. But of course, it will have a lot of implication. Think about um, your insurance company, you know, your premium is going to increase, how the school is going to react to you, how your parents are going to treat their children and say, oh, you know, uh, you might be at risk of doing this or that and that. I mean, uh, it, it can go very far, and uh, something interesting, uh, if you haven't seen this movie, I really recommend it. That was released 20 years ago, and this movie precisely tells you what is happening today. So it was the most amazing prediction of the future about uh, DNA sequencing. Think about an interview, you're having a job, there's no interview anymore. You send your card and it says if you are fitting the job or not, okay? So science has progressed enormously, and um, I think that's the point of being here today, say how far we, are we going, and it says, shall we put some boundaries? Um, and this is an inspiration I had, not directly from the Bible, but I'm a big fan of Michelangelo, so that's the spark of life, yeah? And God giving birth to Adam. And I found this striking analogy that um, this spark of life now can be done in the laboratory where you can create life in a, in a little cube where you can do, in this case, in vitro fertilization. Actually, cloning is almost identical process, but you initiate the cell first and you replace it by um, uh, the nucleus of a somatic cell. So just to finish uh, with a very philosophical uh, slide, uh, again, inspired from the, the Old Testament, is the tree of knowledge of good and evil, okay? So the forbidden fruit here is represented by a book. The book is the knowledge. And humans, we all very curious, okay, and we attracted by knowledge. If I would put a massive wall on Queen's Street and put a little hole in the middle and write in Greek, do not go to the hole, <laughs> what's gonna happen? <laughs> of course. It is what God said as well. Do not approach that tree, you're gonna be in trouble. Here you go. So this there's no um, there's no sin in, in the knowledge, it's what we're doing with the knowledge, okay? So the knowledge can be used for good and for evil use. And a key example is nuclear power, where you can provide electricity for the whole planet. So it was one of the most amazing inventions, okay? But of course, with the same knowledge, you can create the most disastrous, uh, you know, weapon as well. 
So I think this is why we are today, so how far are we going? And so it's what's acceptable and what's not. With this, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so my name is Gordon McKay. I'm the chief executive of the Human Society. So I'm at something of a disadvantage this evening because I'm on the other side there of the learned scientists uh, who, who know the proper terms, the proper language to use in defence of these things. It does remind me of my, my home life for my, my wife, so actually a, a scientist at the same institute as Doug, and it's forever rolling her eyes as I mangle scientific, you know, attempts at scientific technology. I'm not going to try to to um, expand upon any of the areas of science that, that, that Doug has talked about. What interests me as a humanist is what values, how, what, what process do we put in place when we're tackling the, the issues of, of ethical and moral um, consequence. And for those of you who perhaps are not familiar with what humanism actually is, it's a, it's because, because of a growing success in, the, in weddings and funerals, a lot of, we're becoming, people are becoming aware of, of humanism. But not necessarily, it's not necessarily a well understood concept. And I, I think for this evening's purposes, um, I've taken by uh, AC Grayling quotes, which says, Humanism is a non religious ethical outlook based on an interest in human affairs at the human scale. It is not a doctrine or set of rules, it is a starting point. It is a founding idea that ethics must be based on the facts of human experience. And what that, in effect, means to us is that. When we are tackling these big dilemmas of, of, of the day, we must draw upon that human experience, look around us, observe what, 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 you know, what facts we have, and make the best judgment that we can based on the, the evidence we have. What we generally re reject is a truth that is revealed through some, some higher power, the, the idea of a, of a supernatural being. But of course, that doesn't mean that we are we are immoral or, or have uh, uh, no, no kind of ethical framework. And for me as a humanist, the, the kind of two key questions I have to ask myself when thinking about how you know, the moral choices that I personally would want to make or that I would expect society to make collectively for me in, in, in issues like the, the, the fast developing area of, of, of genetics, and I think there, there's some other areas, uh, 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 CRISPR, the, the, mm. the, you know, which can really accelerate the process that, that, you know, that, that, that opens up new opportunities. Is in, we have to have a framework internationally, not just here in, in, in Scotland, to determine how we approach that. But for me, I think there's two, you know, we distill it down into two simple questions, and of course it's, it's never quite as simple as that, but I'll give it a go and say, you know, will my choice harm others? You know, will, the, will the choices, the, where we draw the limits, will that harm anyone? Will a sentient being be, 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 be negatively impacted by that. And then, probably more difficult element is, can I justify my choice when challenged? You know, there's a, is, is, is the choice I'm seeking to make based on, on a, a rational and reasoned, reasoned approach, um, you know, or, or, am I, or is my argument reliant on something that isn't unprovable at, at some later point? And, you know, again, that doesn't necessarily mean that there are no absolute moral values either. I think that the, the, the question really is, you know, based on what we what we can what we know now, can we arrive at the best possible solution to any given problem? And if we can, you know, we, we should be able to, to take you know, what evidence do we have at this point? We should be able to work from there to say that, that is that's our absolute standard of you know, moral of, of, of moral value. That, however, may change as our knowledge changes, but it has you know we have to move with with, with where the evidence is. And I, I don't want to get too pedantic, but I think there's also a consideration of is there a difference between morals and ethics? You know, and morals, I would suggest, to, you know, are, are the framework for arriving at um, you know, a, a, a personal, you know, very often religious or subjective, but you know, morals are, are, are the, kind of the, the way in which we approach the, the issues. And I suggest that ethics are, are more of the, the practical, often shared rather than personal. And moral can, my, my moral framework may differ from someone else's, but actually our ethics may be the same. We may, we may arrive at the same, the same set of <coughs> principles. So how would I, as a humanist, uh, approach the dilemma of the, the, the rapidly 
developing area of genetic technology, gene editing, um, you know, these, these, these other issues. So I, I, my starting point is, will this harm anyone? Can I, can I justify it? What I, what I would struggle with is an argument that, you know, that says we should not be doing, we should not be doing any genetic work, whether it's in you know, sentient beings or, or for that matter, even in uh, plants and other technology, because that would mean that man is playing the role. You know, that, to me, would be a, a non sequitur. You know, it's not a, we're not able to, to, to kind of rationalise and engage with that. But I think, I think Doug, actually, you, you touched on uh, in passing, I think what, what's, what's quite an interesting area, I think, which can let us grapple with some of these issues. That's the area of Down syndrome. And you know, should we, you know, the, the, they face actually a very real prospect that Down syndrome will be eradicated. In, in the not too distant future, as, as the you know, screening techniques become far less invasive, and less likely to, to you know, less risky, which you know, for a lot of a lot of uh, you know, would be mothers uh, choose not to have a procedure, not because they have missed an opposition to it, um, but just because they don't want to take that risk. And I think it is all, it is it would come upon us to to think about you know are we as a society saying that people who have down, you know, down syndrome are less than, than, than anyone else. You know, is that, is that, a, is that a, a societal good to see Down syndrome eradicated? And, and, and I think there's no easy answer to that. If I go back to my, you know, my, my, my kind of three questions, well, who is harmed by, you know, I think we made a choice to say that you know, the state, for instance, could sanction that every, every mother must be screened for Down syndrome, and, and if, if they discover the, 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 the uh, condition there, then you know, we, uh, an abortion may be the, the, may be the, the logical conclusion. Uh, and I would say, well, that, that, that isn't the right way forward. I think that's, that would cause harm because it's not for anyone else to make that choice on, the, on behalf of someone. And there's a difference between knowing, knowing you know, being availed of all the information and being forced to make, to, you know, to being, being forced to draw a line in that. So my view would be that you know, we should we should not set a goal of eradicating Down syndrome as, as it being a, a bad thing or a, or a you know, horrible, horrible phrase or something when it comes to mind, a suboptimal state. Um, you know, we, we should absolutely give parents the, the opportunity to discover that fact for themselves and have you know have access to the, the choices that they want to make for themselves because you know, there's a very strong humanist principle of one of personal autonomy and, and the ability to make those choices um, for, for oneself. And I don't buy into to arguments around slippy slope or you know, if they, if they let people do one thing and then that would open the door to others. I do have the confidence that, that you know, we as a human society, both you know, here and, and across the world, we can work together, cooperate and, and, discover, you know, and, and put in frameworks that they do draw lines. Um, and, and, and I think in this area, you know, we know, for instance, that China, uh, in China, there are there are people working on, on areas of genetic technology that would not be sanctioned in the UK or certainly the US. And you show the Spark of Life slide there. You know, there's, there's research done on the Spark of Life, but if I understand correctly, certainly in the US, it's only done on the enzyme. It's not done in the cell because to create a you know, to fertilize a cell would be creating human life for the purposes of research, and that, 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 that's morally wrong, and the, you know, it's restricted by, by, by Congress. And I, I, think we, I think we should take heart as that we broadly get it right. We broadly, we, we broadly put the, the right controls in place. And I'm always taken to the fact that the scientific, commu scientific community moved quite quickly to identify some of those, you know, those ethical dilemmas that are out there. Um, and maybe a topic for another night, but um, you know, we see that with some of the calls on you know, with artificial intelligence and computer science. You know, there, is, there is already people thinking, you know, what does, what does, our, what does the, 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 the totality of human knowledge now mean for some of the choices that we need to, we can make in the future? Because there have been occasions when we've got it wrong. We don't have to look too far back to see you know, examples of eugenics and you know, people who take a, you know, such a literal, logical conclusion to, to um, some of these issues that they, they arrive in, in very dark places. And for me, I come back to the fact that as a humanist, it's not about having no moral framework, it's about, it's about 
have absolutely have a moral for making the case for an ethical and moral dimension to live exercise of choices, not saying that simply because we're not religious means that we don't have we don't have we don't have the ability or the willingness to, to arrive at, at, at moral teaching. And for the purposes of getting things going um, this evening, I don't think we should manufacture any any, any any kind of controversy. I do I do I do think that the you know, issues like these, issues like um, you know, individual rights versus society's rights. Um, I think the big challenge now is to get an international approach to, to where those lines are drawn. And you know, also looking at what do we do when this happens. It, 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 it must be happening already in places that we don't know. There must be people editing genes Possibly unsuccessfully. It's not to say that they're, 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 they're being successful in their endeavours, but we, we we have to find a, a universal approach, and that is why I think ensuring that the values on which an international agreement can be found is based on uni the universal human values, not human 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 values, and um, is the best framework for getting a, a, a moral approach that can encompass all the, the religious, non-religious worldviews that exist across the across the world, and ensure that. We are, we, we are able to use systems of governance, systems of governance that are making the case for an ethical, rational approach to things. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gordon. Right, Thank you very much. Yeah, a pleasure to be with you this evening, and thanks to Gordon and Douglas for your uh, very erudite and interesting. Uh, Contributions to, to the discussion. Uh, as has already been said, I represent the Church of Scotland. Uh, I work full time for the Church. Uh, I have spent 20 years doing uh, lab based research. Uh, my degree is in genetics. So, this area is, is one uh, with which I'm fairly familiar from a, a te technical point of view. I was interested in uh, Douglas's uh, presentation, but the, the uh, slide that you showed from 23 and Me, one of the slides uh, showed the, the slogan, and I accept that it is an advertising slogan and nothing to do with you. Uh, but it, the, the, the slogan said, Welcome to you. Uh, I don't know if anybody else took note of that. Uh, and that struck me as being very interesting that, that the, the idea that, that simply by looking at 100 markers or more than 100 markers, perhaps in the, in the more updated version of, of uh, the, the Kit that, that 23 and me allows us to, to access uh, that we will understand ourselves uh, completely. And I'm sure Douglas would, would accept that a uh, hundred uh, markers, a thousand markers, even uh, a complete human genome sequence uh, doesn't help us understand who we are. That epigenetics, as, as, uh, as has already been said, there's more to us. Uh, than simply our DNA sequence. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, we were in the process of uh, sequencing the human genome, uh, not me personally, but the, the Human Genome Project. Uh, and it was one of the, the lines that was, was spun there was that once we have sequenced the human genome, we will understand ourselves completely. Uh, and I think we've realized uh, the hubris and the, the, the overstatement that goes there. And I think that's one of the issues that, that sometimes comes through in debates around genetics, uh, perhaps more so than in, in other areas of, of science. Uh, the the over-promising that sometimes goes on. Uh, so that we've got commercial companies such as 23 and Me uh, that, that are saying that, that we can understand ourselves completely simply by looking at our DNA. Uh, but, or we can eradicate certain diseases simply by Using these latest technologies, CRISPR technologies, for example. So the the, the overpromising and the under delivery, uh, I think we have to look very carefully at uh, where we're saying technology might take us if if we wish to go down that route. So the efficacy of, of the technology and, and how uh, it might be deployed. There are questions, particularly around uh, some of the, the CRISPR technologies, some of the the genome editing technologies that are being proposed at the moment, uh, safety issues, safety concerns around how uh, we ensure that 
uh, damage isn't done to the resulting person that comes from the engineered uh, embryo. Uh, we've, as has already been said, we will shortly be uh, celebrating the 20th anniversary of the, the cloning of Dolly the Sheep. Uh, and we know uh, that Ian Wilmot and his, his colleagues, when, when they were developing uh, the cloning technology that was, that, uh, was worked out, uh, that they had many unsuccessful attempts, that many uh, of the, the lambs that were born uh, during the, the cloning experiments uh, were malformed or had other, other issues, and we, we also know that Dolly herself perhaps had su some other issues. That might be acceptable when we're talking about uh, lambs or uh, other animals. Is it acceptable once we, we move on to humans to be, uh, and particularly when we're talking about editing the, the, the genome, uh, the germline genome, uh, how is that going to affect uh, the individual? Uh, because if we're talking about germline genetic engineering, then uh, that uh, we're talking about developing that that embryo on to become a fully formed human. And remember, all of us at one point in our lives were embryos. Uh, we've all gone through that that stage and come through the other side. But I hope questions around ethics, uh, and that's already been touched on. And I think we need to to remember that we as as humans are part of society and. Uh, if we start looking at the ways in which we, we might engineer humans as individuals, uh, then how does that mean that we view people in the world around about us? Uh, I suffer from male pattern baldness and hairy ears, both of which are genetic <laughs> diseases, uh, so perhaps uh, my parents might have wanted to screen out these two, uh, these two uh, things that, that are part of me, that are fundamentally part of me. And all of us, as has already been said, have particular mutations, and if, if we change these, uh, does that change us fundamentally? Although, always remembering that we are more than simply our DNA, our DNA is fundamental to what we are, but we are more than simply our DNA. So I think in considering these issues, we, we uh, within the church, would argue that, that we have to be prudent about how we uh, approach some of these issues. We have to be uh, careful about uh, what we do, that we have responsibility, that we have moral and ethical responsibility as to how we use and deploy these technologies, as already been said. Uh, the analogy with the, the splitting of the atom uh, has, has already been made, uh, and I think there are many who would argue that that uh, is, is uh, an issue that we maybe need to think about. That many of the technologies that we, we as humans develop can be deployed in good ways, but also uh, can be misused, and we have to be a little bit, little bit careful uh, about how uh, we deploy these technologies. So we within the church would, would say that the framework which that all uh, human endeavors need to have an ethical and a moral framework, uh, and that we need to be very careful about how we proceed, uh, and to, to be careful about the frameworks that we use. So uh, I think I'll just leave it at there. Thank you very much. I understand at this point, so I can see you all better. And I'm going to throw the uh, conversation open to the floor. Who would like to raise any questions or issues or have a comment on what we've heard so far? Yes, please. Back. Do you feel that uh, universal code of ethics is achievable? Do I address any particular, or would you like to write a little bit? All of them. Who'd like to respond to the universal case? <coughs> no, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, th I think I raised it in passing. Um, yes, I think, I think it is. And I think we've achieved it on a number of occasions near the uh, Non Nuclear Proliferation Treaty, would be actually a rather a form of, of, of an ethical approach that says, you know, here and no further, we, may, we, we learn from our mistakes. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is, is, a, is a, you know, a, a real testament to you know, a merger of Western, Eastern values and an articulation of those, those, those universal values. So I certainly think it's, it's achievable. Um, but like any of these things, people have to, have to desire that, that outcome. Um, and I think in this context, I think one of the key things is, is knowing what is predictable 
you know, and, I, and, I, and I do wonder actually about the, the, the splitting of the atom analogy because we knew when we were making, when we were, when we, you know, when, when mankind was uh, not going to tell us to do but um, you know, when, when we, when we, when scientists were working on splitting the atom with a view to, to yeah, an energy source, we also knew that it released all the, you know, all, all this uh, dangerous matter and energy. So it wasn't, it wasn't as if we, we were unaware that there were all that consequences. I think the difference with this debate is we're being invited to be concerned about things that we don't yet predict. You know, we, can, we, can, we can guess at, but we don't necessarily yet have, the, have a route map or, or evidence that, we're, that that will necessarily result from a co this course of action. So I think we need a, we need a framework that enables the, across the world to progress at a, a similar rate because there's no point having, you know, there's no point US and Europe adopting a, a, a framework and then you know, China, you know, we've seen it with the, with the, you know, the cloning of dogs, you know, one of the first ones in, in, in China. We've seen, you know, we've seen it, it, it happen before. Um, and I think it's not going to happen in this, in an isolated way. Though. So it's going to, it has to be about a broader approach to international cooperation, international development, um, that, that ensures that everyone's got a stake because Otherwise, if we exclude some people from that discussion, then we, we go off, there's an advantage then to go off and do this thing. So, yes, we can. We should, we should think we can. I'm not sure that I would agree. I think that as, as we see, uh, some of the te these technologies have already been deployed in China, uh, which there have been scientific publications uh, which indicate that some labs in China are already doing germline genetic engineering of humans. Um, so, to, to, to say that, I mean, even if you look around Europe, the, the, what's legal in some European countries is very different from what's legal in the UK. So, even within Europe, which is, is a relatively homogeneous ethical outlook, uh, the, the, I would say that there's different approaches that are taken in terms of the legal restrictions that are put on. So, that in the UK, many things are permissible in the UK in terms of, of experimentation of human embryos not be permissible in many other European countries. So even within Europe, I think that we're drawing the line so to, uh, in different places. So I think we have to, uh, I would be a little bit uh, skeptical that we, we could come to the point where we agree on everything. And remember, we don't even have a, a universal ban on human cloning. Hmm. Uh, we, we didn't manage to, to come to, to even agree on that. Um, so I think we've got a long way from, from a universal uh, acceptance of, of where the lines should be drawn, and how we should draw the lines, and where, how far we should go. Yeah, I think yeah, I think it's it's an ideal. It would be certainly an ideal uh, situation, um, but, but um, again, uh, I, I would join you as well. It's going to be very very difficult because uh, I mean there's three different levels um, where ethics taking place. Obviously, there's a cultural background, there's a, a, you know, the religious background, and obviously everybody has their own ethics um, uh, as well. And the other thing we need to keep in mind is that the, the way the market works is that um, if, there's a, if there's a demand, you create an offer. And, you know, I think I convinced everybody here with a cap that, you know, if people are, are happy to spend 50,000 or 100,000 pounds to clone their dogs, you know, I mean, obviously, you, you're going to create an offer. I mean, people will be happy to you know, develop some business with it, uh, and, and that, that, that's the, the way it is, very sadly, but um, it, it's actually very, very difficult uh, to, to, to stop this happening, uh, and that is valid for any, any kind of aspect of a market, is that, you know, if people are, you know, asking for it, uh, you know, you're going to develop this, uh, and, uh, and you, you can see this, uh, I mean, even human cloning, there's been a lot of attempt, uh, and uh, fail all the time, but th th there is definitely a, a certain demand, and, and people are, are happy to, uh, to go for it. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, stopping this to happen uh, can be very difficult, but it would be ideal for sure. Thank you. We'll come to the first and then we'll get Okay. Uh, it seems like people don't want a lot of genetic, especially with cloning, they don't want it to happen in very short sort of blocks of time. My question is from all of your point of views in this. Representative church in the realm of science. You don't regulate people really when they produce. Why should we think about regulating for cloning? Um, I mean, can you repeat? Could you repeat the question, please? We don't regulate 
regulates people in terms of their natural breeding processes, why should we regulate cloning? Is that an adequate sort of yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, you'd like to respond to that, please. <laughs> 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 Well, I think by, by having children, I mean, it gives people the right to create life, uh, right? And, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an obvious and very good question, but it's, it's, uh, you know, it's not really answered. But yeah, it's, uh, and it's, it's I, I think, without, I mean, there's no answer to the question really, but um, what I'm saying is that, you know, who has the right of the spark of life, that's one thing, but then, the aftermath uh, as well, because uh, you can see a lot of, of, of children around having really, you know, parents behaving extremely badly and, and, and so on and so on. And the people are, I would say, genetically perfectly healthy and they have, you know, they're perfectly fine. But their parents are being really bad influences on, on the children. So it goes all the time, says at the end, uh, do we have to regulate? what we should regulate, what we shouldn't regulate, because at the end, you know, we should give right to people say, okay, you are allowed to breed, but if you breed, you might, you might be a good, you, mean, you might be allowed to breed, but you're not allowed to raise your kids because you're not the right parents, and, and so on. So it, it, it almost goes forever, and, and, and at the end, I think um, it, it's, it's almost the same responsibility than someone would make, a, as you say, a cloning or, or genetically modified. Uh, you see what I mean? Because I think the, the responsibility is actually almost the same, I would say, right? I mean, it's a, it, it, what's the worst is having, you know, a good education of someone, I'm putting a scenario, and if you think I'm provocative, it's on purpose, I try to create the reaction, right? So, <laughs> I, I, I usually people think I'm, I'm, I'm pushing this too far, but I think it's on purpose, but just imagine the scenario, we are in a movie, okay? You make someone genetic engineered, but you know, with a good education, that person will be perfectly fine. Or you want someone who is perfectly naturally born, but having you know the worst parents ever is going to have a you know a disastrous lifetime. So at the end, the, the parents are you know enormous responsibility of the children, and who has the right uh, to to give? Everybody has the right to give birth to uh, you know a, a different levels, and it's uh, if you start regulating this, I mean. Totally impossible. I mean, and it's part of the, vari the, va the variety of, of uh, what the human mind is. Uh, but it's, um, it's, it's a perfectly good point. I, I would say the challenge of fairness, though, is that, I mean, we do regulate reprodu reproduction uh, in, in, in the UK. Um, everyone has a right to attempt to, to, be, to become parents, um, but you know, we place limits on IVF in terms of state funded IVF. We place there's a, a series of limits on, on any on a number of artificial uh, interventions, so I think the, the the difference with cloning technology is you know, is how do we how do we regulate how do we what limits do we draw when it's an art, when it's, when it's a, an, an external intervention and uh, I, I can't honestly answer where that line should abso absolutely be, but. We, you know, people don't have the right to be parents. They have the right to try, and I think there is a there, there is a, a, a subtle distinction there because you, know, you if you if you are you know, not, if you, you are unable to, to conceive naturally, then you have you rely on this, the science. You can go through IVF treatment. I think it's three. I think it's down to two attempts now that the, the, the state will fund, and then it's down to your. Your, your ability to do it, and even then, clinics will place a limit depending on age and, and health and other things. So, we are we are not autonomous beings in, in, in that sense, um, and I think it's appropriate, in a similar level, that we find a, an accommodation for where the, you know, personal autonomy is, is absolutely respected as a human. I think it's too often drawn too nar I mean, drawn quite narrowly, um, especially in the right to not just a dignified life but a dignified death. Um, but how do we how do we create a set, set of scenarios for the new future? I'm not too sure. Yeah, I think I would agree with a lot of what's already been said, and, and, and I think we need to be careful about exactly how we deploy these technologies. Like if, if we do deploy these technologies, um, questions around market forces and uh, exactly who benefits 
that's the case for some of these, these issues. But we also need to remember that when we're talking about a lot of these reproductive technologies, we're not simply talking about commodities, we're talking about people resulting from these technologies. And so a clone is a, is a person. Uh, a genetically modified embryo will become a person. Uh, so, I mean, you might argue, and we do argue as to exactly when life begins, but the fact is that, that all of us have gone through this stage of being embryos and we've all become fully formed humans. Um, so, it, we're not simply talking about a, a commodity, we're talking about the fact that this reproductive technologies that are moving towards becoming sentient beings. Can I ask, you, can I, would you say I see a difference between the phenomenon of acclimatization and the ethical co consequences of IVF or the, the cloning? I mean, as, as you know, Doug outlined, <coughs> even a clone's um, being is an individual, you know, they're, they're shaped by their experiences and the diseases and, and uh, various things that, that happen to them. So is there any real difference between what you just call a test tube baby and a, and a, and a clone baby? Um, I don't think we have any mm. artificial clones, obviously, as we mm. said, twins are clones in, mm. in, in genetics, strict genetic sense, but artificial clones, at least for human, in human terms, it's not something that we, as far as I'm aware, achieve at this stage where there's some uh, suggestion that that uh, has been the case. The test tube babies have been around for a number of years. That IVF is still a very inefficient process. Mm. Uh, there's still, uh, I think, fewer than 30% of, of cycles result in a, a, a baby being born. And so uh, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of questions around just how that technology, even after all these years, uh, is, is able to, to be used. It's, it's often seen as being a magic bullet, but it's not quite as straightforward as, as many would argue. Um, but uh, yeah, I think there, there are, uh, the question uh, was, whether cloning and IVF are, are different. Well, I suppose it's, it's more, um, I, mean, I think my fear would be it's the harm caused in the process of getting from where technology is just now to where a perfected cloning would, would be. When you talked about the, the harm caused to the, the, the pre-dolly yes. experiments. And I think that, that's probably, that for me is the immediate moral anxiety. But, well, you know, just for the, for the purposes of discussion, uh, assuming it could be done safely without causing harm, then I think it would challenge us to consider there's any real ethical difference between a cloned child produced safely and, uh, and an IVF, you know, it's still, the spark of life is still coming in, in, from artificial intervention. Um, mm. sure Without genetic modification, you know, that's, that's an important thing to yes. say, is that you can argue that a clone, although it's a clone, has no, has no genetic modification. Instead of being fused by two cells, father and mother is just one cell that was with an individual. Could you actually say it? Thank you. A lot of diseases uh, have a genetic component. And I think most of us would agree that uh, our moral judgments are too difficult when we're dealing with infectious diseases. And if they're infectious diseases that we can treat uh, by some kind of Particular case is 
about that really is selection. Uh, I, I gave very specific examples yeah. of you know, selecting uh, embryos that would give rise to successive early children each time. And any comments on that? It's really interesting. Well, you also see with, with parents who are offered cochlear implants uh, and may choose to turn turn it down. You know, I used to work in a disability charity and it's a very live, very live discussion. You know, and, you know, lately you kind of caught yourself there talking about deficiency and you know, there are, you know, I go back to my kind of moral framework, you know, what is the harm caused? Are we saying that to be deaf in modern society is harmful? Uh, is that cause, does that cause harm to, to an individual? It certainly creates disadvantage and the whole other ethical deb debate about the medicalised nature of disability and um, whether it is, it is society that disables people who have sensory impairments or whether it is the impairment itself with, with specific advantages. And, like, and it, it, there's no, you know, there's, 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 there's only, a, there's only a, a line that individuals can draw for, them, for themselves. I think where I would be anxious is where the state would prevent a parent making, making that judgment or where that judgment is arrived at for reasons which are not Properly explored and, 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 and well argued, you know, well well set out because it, it but it does take me back to the fact that this that these kind of moral questions exist already. You know, it's not it's not just about genetic engineering. I, th I think what you mentioned is basically well um, uh, explained in Gataka, and I can again uh, encourage you to, to watch it. But you have the situation where the, the couple uh, is consulting uh, the person who has the FM. He says, well, we have, I was just putting the cards on the table, we have eight embryos, and they're all fine, but some are, are, are much better, and having a better chance. And uh, the way, I mean, it, it's, for a movie, the, the way they present it, it's, it's really obviously convincing people, but it says, they're all you, but this one would be the best of you. So it says, <laughs> it, it's not, we're not modifying anything, it's just this one has the best chance, um, you know, to, uh, to having no issues uh, during the lifetime. But I, I think the other, uh, I mean, I'm not an economist, so maybe we should, uh, we should have one in the panel as well, but the, 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 the way the market works, uh, we need to be aware that the, I mean, health has a, a huge cost. You have absolutely no idea. I mean, my, my I had this personal experience, my, my dad had a kind of, it's not a really a leukemia, I mean, the opposite, so the bone marrow stopped producing cells. And because my, my dad worked for the army, um, um, he was actually in the hospital while I did my PhD, and at the end, uh, the, the insurance started to get against him because he said, yeah, because he had a car in the army, so he should have, you know, the army should pay for it. He says, yeah, but, uh, you know, the treatment wasn't done in the, in, the, in the military hospital, so and so on. So they sent the bill straight to us, and uh, that was in Belgium, France, only now in euros, but you, you would be shocked for only three months of hospital and some kind of treatment, and not even talking chemotherapy and bone marrow transplant, it's absolutely huge. So now the way, and, and again, it's the way Kanaka is trying to present this to the, to the people and says, well, here's two options, uh, well, there's three options. We do the hardcore, um, you know, uh, medical intervention, chemotherapy, different kind of stuff. We have the, the new trends, uh, genetic therapy or CRISPR, that's even more, um, uh, very expensive, of course, but there's all the ethical issues. Or actually, the, the cheapest version is the, the 23 and me that saw before pre implantation screening the embryos because a thousand pounds, which is affordable for NHS, I mean, it's, it's fine for everybody. And in the future, that person will have absolutely no diseases at all and will be perfectly fine. So, you know, we're going to reduce a lot of the cost of the NHS. And you can see the way it's presented. <coughs> I'm not convincing you, I'm just telling you what the movie is all about. Um, and uh, it's, it's put in such a, a nice way that it's, you know, he says, yeah, I mean, that's, that's right. I mean, it's going to be so much easier for everybody. But think about it. Whatever you're doing, whatever the decision you're taking, there's always consequences. And my, my, my personal consequences to all of this, you can, go, you can take Dolly, you can, because I've been running those courses of this all the time, is that imagine, uh, that, that's maybe the, the, the dream of everybody is, you know, immortality because it's what we're talking about in a way is that nobody wants to die, you know, 80 or 100 years old. So what's going to happen is that the population on Earth is growing. It's not that people making more babies, it's just medicine that has improved so much that everything becomes viable. 
and consequences. We try to clone him Dolly because we try to have him better uh, farm animals to produce more meat. We've been doing genetic selection with crops for thousands of years. Don't forget that. So we've been trying to improve, you know, getting, uh, you know, increasing this game all the time. So how far are we going with this? Uh, I don't know because actually a better health. Uh, it's quite pessimistic things to say. I mean, I'm still very young and healthy, but I, I might I might have different thought in, uh, in 20 years time. But uh, yeah, we're increasing the, 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 the world population, and, and uh, uh, although this what they call genomic medicine, the kind of preventive medicines, because we kind of choosing the embryo to make sure the disease doesn't happen, right? Uh, has will have immediately a direct economic impact because it will be less, you know, medical care. But obviously, in the long term, after a few generations, I mean, we're going to increase a lot. With, um, and, and people doing this all the time. I mean, you mentioned uh, deafness, but think of the face like disease for Jewish population. What I, I just show you on Facebook. I mean, that's. It's an idea on Facebook, but actually people choosing their path according if they carry or not for, for a specific disease. So people already do this <coughs> genetic dating, try to find the ideal path according to their genes. So forget the blue eyes or, you know, good looking, it's, it's all about the genes. And, and this is happening already. Uh, so it's called the royal family. It is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, it's a very good job selling gas
inform the way in which I behave will be what I am. I guess too, a, a religious tradition is one which is um, shaped through time. It's, it's not simply a case of always looking back to uh, texts that were written 2,000 years ago. It's an ongoing tradition of interpreting those texts as an ongoing inter uh, interpretation of facts in a scientific tradition. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that, that all feeds into it, of course, as well. The same as what you were saying, the, you know, if you share my sort of, you know, pedantic distinction between morals and, and, and ethics, the, the, the ethics can be something that usually a reason you know, that we, we, we arrive at through you know, prediction, observation, and you know, all, all those kind of things. Whereas where we probably differ is, is what our, how we draw our moral framework and how we, we arrive at moral framework. But the, the ethical conclusion may well be the same, if not. But again, you have deontological and consequ consequentialist mm -hmm. ethical systems in religious and non religious contexts. So it's perfectly possible to mm have -hmm. a, a, a secular, if you were, rules of ethics system too. Sorry. The Just Festival takes place in Edinburgh throughout August. To see their programme of events, visit just-festival.org. Thank you for listening to the latest episode of the Humanity Podcast. We hope you found it interesting and enjoyable. Do please let us know if this longer panel format is something you'd like to see us do a bit more of. Make sure to give us a rating to let us know how we're doing and help us improve. And if you enjoyed it, make sure to share and subscribe. We'll see you next month for the next episode. Bye for now.